Control was developed by Remedy Entertainment and released in the summer of 2019 to praise and critical success. It won IGN's Game of the Year that year and currently rests at a rating of very positive on Steam with over 25,000 reviews. This clearly is a game that resonated with many, many people. I don't typically do spoiler warnings this early in my videos, but it seems important with this one because as I think most fans will agree, the best part of Control is being in the world that Remedy has created. If this is a game that you intend to play, you should not watch this video until you have done so. You can return here afterwards and likely tell me how wrong you think many of my opinions are. Consider this your first of two spoiler warnings. I'll be outlining my points for this video critique over the next couple minutes and will offer a second spoiler warning before we fully dive in. If you're still unsure if Control is for you or not, perhaps continue watching and decide once you've heard a bit more. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have quite as positive an experience with Control as many others did. That's not to say my view of this game is negative. I would say I'm still firmly in the positive range, but I'm closer to the negative side than I originally thought I would be. Control is an action-adventure game centered on the Federal Bureau of Control, or FBC for short, which is a shadowy government agency that identifies, studies, and attempts to contain paranormal items and events. Players take control of Jesse Faden, an outsider who arrives at the headquarters of the FBC in search of her brother, but quickly finds that the Bureau has been taken over by an invading paranormal enemy known as the Hiss. In order to uncover the details about her brother, Jessie joins the efforts to regain control of the FBC from this enemy. As I hinted at earlier, the world and setting in control is incredibly well built and feels real. I mean that too, it genuinely feels like this place and this branch of our government could exist, which is about the highest compliment I think I could give in this regard. While Jesse Faden is the character you play as, I don't think it's unfair to say that the real main character is the Federal Bureau of Control itself. The building, dubbed the oldest house, as well as what dwells within are the best things about this game. Now, where Control suffers the most is the contrasting quality of the other parts that make up its experience. I'm going to be using that word quite a lot in this video, experience, because I think it serves as a good summation of everything that Control is. The experience of the game is made up of four general pieces, world building, side content, story, and combat. For how much enjoyment each of these pieces brought to the overall experience of Control, I would probably put them in the same order. Now, this is different from how important I think each of these pieces are to the experience of Control. In that case, I would firmly place everything below the world building, but on roughly the same tier. The game knows that the world is its greatest strength, and so it leans into it at all possible moments. While each of these three pieces are part of the experience of Control, I would say each of them feels significantly less developed than the world and setting. I'd go so far as to say that it feels like these other parts of the game exist only to serve the world building instead of having their own merits. If you want an analogy, it would be something like this. The world in setting is a king atop a throne, lording above these other aspects of the game, which are working tirelessly to feed it. This king is so well fed not only because of this support from these underlings, but because of its own private food reserves that it has access to. Unfortunately, this means that each of the underlings ends up being short on food themselves, causing them to wither and eventually die as time goes on. Control has problems. Only half of the main story missions provide some sort of plot progression, while the other half are there simply as conduits to shepherd players on a sightseeing trip through the Bureau headquarters. Additionally, the game doesn't know how to provide resolutions to its many narratives, often just hand-waving away questions in favor of mystery and awe. As an outsider looking in, it seems like less time went into the writing of the main narrative, and I say these criticisms as someone who generally liked or was interested in what little story there was. 
The side content lacks the mechanical rewards you typically see in a Metroidvania-style game. Control quickly offers nothing worthwhile from engaging with its optional side content outside of just seeing the sights and collecting lore, both of which I enjoyed while also finding to be not enough progression. Control has many, many in-game documents and audio logs. I collected 17 in just the first 40 minutes of the game. This is mostly a good thing in my opinion, but it also means that the game needs something to break up the segments of exploration and world building, which brings us to combat. Initially, it was terrific, but it eventually became sigh-inducing for me. The game reached a point where the encounters felt and played exactly the same due to the lack of diverse and unique upgrades available to the player. It became one-size-fits-all in terms of enemy encounters and player approach. This caused me to grow tired of the very part of the game that was meant to provide me breaks from the exposition and lore dumps. I intend to provide evidence to support the claims I've already made, but I am also willing to admit that some of my issues with control might be me problems versus game problems. Expectations and desires I had for the game versus judging it for what it is. I'll go into one specific example of this much later in the video that many are likely to disagree with me on, and yes, it's the ashtray maze. My point remains that if Remedy's goal was to fully flesh out this world, then they have succeeded. Every element more or less individually goes towards supporting that goal. However, if they intended to tell a good story in addition to establishing this world, then they have failed. If they intended to make a system that incentivizes exploration not just for the wonders of the world, but for tangible rewards, they have failed. If they intended to make a balanced and engaging combat and loot system, they have also failed. I don't say these statements with a smile on my face either. If the other parts of Control's experience were as great as its world building, I think it very well could have been one of my favorite games of all time. Because there truly is something about this world that grabs me. Shaking up the general format of my videos, I'll be discussing the combat first, side content second, and then the main narrative third. The current flaws as well as the solutions for improving these three core parts of the game are deeply connected to each other and make sense to go in this order. All of these sections will also include discussions on the two expansions that released after the main game. So this is now your second and final spoiler warning. I spoil the hell out of this game, as well as the general plot of another Remedy game, Alan Wake. After all the time that I've spent with Control, I've realized that the combat is my least favorite part of the game, although initially this wasn't the case. The early hours of the game struck a great balance between introducing new enemy types and new combat abilities or techniques for players. Players have two options for attacking, the gun which is known as the service weapon, and then the supernatural abilities. The two methods are intertwined however due to neither having a permanent ammo or energy cost. This design has a large impact on how the combat in the game plays, as you can likely imagine, but it also is directly related to why Control's combat experience rapidly decays, from encounters feeling fresh and unique into each feeling and playing exactly the same. I imagine I likely pissed some people off with that statement, but I hope that you'll hear me out. As I mentioned, your service weapon has unlimited ammo, but operates with a specific number of available shots before it has a short recharge period. The exact amount of shots you have prior to requiring that recharge differs depending on which form the weapon is in. Similar to the morph gun in the later Jack and Daxter games, the service weapon has five additional forms that can be bought using resources found within the game world. Each of the forms functions like one of the classic shooter weapons. The default mode you begin with is like a pistol, then there are shotgun, machine gun, rifle, rocket launcher, and remote grenade launcher forms to further unlock. For a frame of reference on the variations of ammo amounts, the default pistol form has 14 shots, the shotgun has 6, the machine gun has 30, 
the rifle form two, and both the rocket and grenade launcher forms have three shots. Each of the forms also have modifications that can be equipped to slightly tweak their stats, such as higher damage or faster rate of fire. I'll be discussing the modification system in greater detail a bit later in this video. I think it's important to add that none of the service weapon forms are required outside of the starting pistol. The game doesn't feature any enemies that have weaknesses or immunities to the different gun styles. This is likely because they can be unlocked in any order, but also because you can only have two forms active at any given time. Swapping out those two forms requires going through a series of menus, and it's hardly conducive to engaging combat to have to pause in order to swap to the different versions. I often just stuck to the guns I had equipped, even if they didn't feel like the best fit for the encounter. Giving players the ability to cycle between all of the forms using the left and right buttons on the d-pad seems like it would have made sense, and those buttons currently aren't used for anything. So if I thought of this, I'm sure that Remedy did as well, and I'm not sure why it wasn't implemented. It would have allowed for more experimentation, situational usage, and perhaps allowed for an increased differentiation of the enemy types. Now, your other tools during combat come from a host of supernatural abilities. Giving a bit of context, throughout the early parts of the game, Jesse finds paranormal objects that can be bound to an individual, and once done so, grant the user a special power. These are called Objects of Power, or OOPs, and are quite cool, managing to feel special each time you uncover one. There are five within the game that grant combat-related powers, although technically six because the service weapon is also one, but we're going to exclude it for the purposes of this explanation. Two are tied to the main story and are required in order to progress, while the other three are found in side quests early on and are optional. The five powers are Throw, which is given in the second mission, Shield, Rush, and Seize are the three that are optional, and finally Levitate is gained in the sixth mission. There are ten missions in the base game's narrative, so provided that players complete the side missions when they become available, they will have the complete set of powers available to them for the last third of the game, as well as for the end game content. For reference as well, I'm not including the powers gained during the Foundation expansion because they are isolated to that specific location of the map and because they suck. Of these five powers, only one is really in attack, throw. It allows Jesse to telekinetically grab an object and hurl it at an enemy. Levitate propels you into the air and is more used in combat for repositioning, although there's an upgrade path based around performing a ground slam. This never felt truly viable to me because it drained your energy while also potentially leaving you exposed against other enemies. Finally, the other three abilities serve more as utility for combat as opposed to attacks. Shield allows you to create a forward-facing barrier to temporarily block damage. Rush is your run-of-the-mill dash ability, and Seize enables you to mind control an enemy once they have low enough health. The problem here is the opposite of the problem with the service weapon forms. Both Throw and Levitate clearly outclass the other three abilities. I found Throw to be the best offensive ability in the entire game simply because it auto-locks onto enemies and none have a way to completely avoid these attacks. Even if they initially dodge to one side, using the ability rapidly will make it too quick for them to dodge the consecutive throws. The Levitate ability also completely trivializes several of the enemy types and obstacles in the game, such as the Astral Spikes. These slow-moving, indestructible, pulsating orbs chased the player and were almost always one of my favorite encounters early on because you had to always be aware of their location. However, they are confined to the ground, and so once you have unlocked Levitate, they become little more than an afterthought. Another example would be the enemy type known as the Hiss Distorted, which can turn invisible and rapidly moves around in order to try and surprise attack the player with a short range but massively damaging attack. This enemy has no means of a long range attack, and so if you are levitating or even standing on an object out of range like a shelf, it'll just roam around and never uncloak. 
Levitate also nullifies environmental design from a combat perspective because if you are in the air it matters much less how the arena is structured and where different routes lead you in the environment. I'm not saying that levitate shouldn't have existed or needed to be less effective either, I'm simply pointing out that the nature of the power creates issues. The other three abilities, Shield, Rush, and Seize, are all fine and mostly feel like they are here because modern video games often have a dash or shield mechanic. Unfortunately, both Shield and Rush lose much of their intrinsic value once players unlock Levitate as it works better at repositioning and avoiding damage in most circumstances. This brings us to enemy variety, which on paper is quite good. The variety of the hiss-infected enemies is quite high, and as I mentioned, earlier on in the game it does a great job introducing these new types at a steady rate. There are standard gun enemies that carry everything from grenade launchers to shotguns. There are hiss clusters, which are another giant orb that exclusively heals other enemies in the area. Hiss Charged that move towards you and trigger a self-explosion. The Hiss Distorted I mentioned a few moments ago that turn invisible. There are enemies that have shields, enemies that levitate, and enemies that have shields while levitating. In the early game, these can be especially difficult to deal with. There are fungal zombie-like enemies that have infected parts of the oldest house and shamble towards you. Now, for me to accurately explain the problem the enemy variety has, I want to briefly take one step back to look at the goals of the combat system because this gives us some insight into its design. The goal of combat in control is clearly to be flashy. Engagement through spectacle versus engagement through intensity or difficulty. The game often focuses on having large numbers of enemies per battle, with multiple waves of enemies spawning one after the other. You'll often be traveling through the FBC and enemies will randomly spawn into the room, forcing you to fight or run away, not unlike random encounters in mini JRPGs. This is opposed to say something like The Last of Us, where enemies in combat encounters are tightly designed and typically in small numbers because every one of them is dangerous. To be clear, I'm not saying Control needs The Last of Us's combat. There are a few moments in the game, specifically with several of the boss battles, where it is essentially you versus one beefy enemy, and these are some of the worst combat moments in my opinion. What I'm trying to say is that Control's combat is ultimately not designed in a way where enemy variety particularly matters, because it's more focused on opportunities for you, the player, to feel like a badass versus like you might be in danger. Players don't have to worry about ammo or power availability or what works best for different enemies, and so it creates opportunities for you to be flying through the air, hurling shit across the room, and that's great, but it also has consequences. The issues with all three of these factors, the service weapon, your abilities, and enemy variety not mattering, unfortunately end up creating a negative feedback loop with each other. The gun gameplay is limited to whatever you currently have equipped due to the clunkiness of constantly trying to switch in the menus, as well as because the forms of the guns don't particularly make a meaningful difference. This isn't an issue itself because the throw ability will be your main source of damage output anyways. Once you unlock the levitate ability you will always be in the air because it's awesome but also because it's advantageous and the enemy variety offers no hard counters for it. Because your abilities strip enemies of their uniqueness it means that combat encounters instead just throw wave after wave of enemies at you which reinforces not trying to change your gun form, but also how identical most of the enemies feel in the chaos of the combat. Enemies can't be made more unique or specific because the combat isn't designed for small-scale fights, and when it currently does try to do that, the enemies just become bullet sponges. You can't give them real meaningful weaknesses as it is right now either, as that would require swapping guns frequently or perhaps adding ammo, because unlimited ammo trivializes enemies having weaknesses at all. I often found myself groaning when I had to fight enemies, as I was just trying to get from point A to point B, and because the magic of the combat system had worn off on me. I began to dread combat encounters, which my gut tells me isn't good. 
It took me out of the world and instead forced me to experience a combat loop that felt the same over and over again. Not having ammo or energy cost is a design choice and one that I think should be kept, but I think it creates a lot of problems that need to be ironed out for it to be the most effective that it can be. Now, not a silver bullet for these issues by any means, but one solution that would assist in improving the combat system would be providing more upgrades and modifications that allowed for augmentation of how combat felt on the player's end. Keeping the clear design philosophy of flashy and chaotic combat, but allowing for more variety of what the player is capable of. The natural way to do this would be providing these rewards through interesting side content, which naturally leads us into the discussion on this part of the game, which certainly provides the interesting, just not the rewards. If I were given only one word to describe the side content and control, it would be great. If I were allowed a second word, there would be a big fat however following it. I think it's important to define what is meant by side content in this situation because not everyone uses that word to mean the same thing. In Control's case, I would use this word to encapsulate everything from its side quests, its procedurally generated mini quests, to the exploration of the world, and finally its loot system. Although I think this last one straddles combat as well. This aspect of Control, the umbrella side content phrase I'm using, does more for building this world than any other part of the game's experience, even the main story by my estimation. However, it falls short of what I consider a responsibility to offer meaningful rewards to players for completion of this content. Side content is typically driven by curiosity, questions about how to get to certain areas that are out of reach, or interesting quest hooks. They should naturally generate a sense of excitement about what's waiting around that next corner. Equally as important to creating this sense of wonder, though, is providing a worthwhile resolution, offering players something that was worth their time, because if you don't, you disincentivize players from exploring at all. Mini games, and specifically Metroidvanias, provide this value through upgrades and unlockables, and initially there are meaningful rewards to be found in Control namely in the form of the three unlockable powers, Seize, Shield, and Rush. However, these unlocks stop almost immediately and are replaced with a generic loot system called Modifications, which minimally alter different percentages on your guns and abilities. Think increasing your gun's zoom by 12%, or increasing the rate of fire by 15%. Unfortunately, you are more bombarded with these than Livy Dunn is with DM requests. These modifications drop constantly for both completion of side quests, as well as from loot chests hidden throughout the world. Worse, however, is that they don't tangibly modify your gameplay experience. 12% increase in my gun's zoom isn't something I notice. The second expansion for the game does try to fix this by offering a single unique modification for each of your service weapon forms, and while I want to acknowledge that this is a step in the right direction, outside of one that essentially removes your pistol form's recharge if your shots hit, I didn't find any to be truly gameplay changing. Even earning additional ability points doesn't feel exciting because much of the ability trees are just percentage increases to your different stats, such as health, power energy, or power damage. This is all frustrating but also confusing given that the new forms of the service weapon could have been used as rewards for the side content instead of as something you buy in a menu screen. After unlocking each, it could have placed players in a scenario where it showcases the form's strength and function, similar to what the game already does with the three optional powers. So we've come to the first problem with the side content. If the upgrades and unlockable rewards aren't interesting, how do you motivate players to engage with the side content? 
Well, I think it's important to mention that unlockable powers or upgrades aren't strictly the only type of rewards that can be offered. Mini games reward players through hidden bosses, traversal challenges, additional puzzles, or lore documents and audio logs. Control does attempt to utilize all of these as rewards within the game currently, and there are moments where they are a success. Unfortunately, however, they miss more often than they hit. To begin this discussion, let's start with what I think is the best piece of side content in the game, the side quest centered on the mirror altered item. An altered item is very similar to the objects of power that we discussed during the combat portion of this video. They are objects that have been involved in paranormal events and as such have been altered themselves, often featuring new properties or what seem like personalities. What's the difference between objects of power and altered items? Think of them like storms. Objects of power are like tropical cyclones or hurricanes for the uneducated. They're big, rare, and scary. Of course, directors can just bind the OOP and become the eye of the storm. Altered items are more like weird thunderstorms. Some may rain frogs, some may rain corn, but they all rain something. There is a whole section of the Bureau called the Panopticon that is specifically for containing these items, and then another sector that researches how to correctly soothe each of the different objects. There's a few more layers to the lore of these items, but for now this is an adequate explanation. As players move through the research sector, they find the synchronicity labs, and within them there's a containment cell that requires a high level clearance in order to access. Why'd they keep an altered item here? There's the initial curiosity. As you explore the containment area, you uncover documents and audio logs pertaining to the item. Debrief for Mirror Excursion 7C. Subject is Agent Hardy. Hardy spent approximately three hours in the mirror. The longest time on record. Can you describe your experience inside Agent Hardy? So, Agent Hardy is physically healthy, all tests have come back clean, yet the speech issue has persisted for hours. I'm willing to bet that many players were like me and immediately had the hairs on the back of their necks stand up because something feels quite eerie with this situation. Although I'm willing to admit that it could have just been me because I find something especially unsettling about backwards talking. The mirror is tightly locked down within a corridor, even complete with two security cameras watching the item at all times. Unlocking the object requires the player solve a puzzle where they raise and lower different window panels in order to match what is seen in the mirror's reflection on the security footage. This is likely the most complex puzzle in the game, and I enjoyed solving it. Entering into the mirror world continued and amplified the sense of dread for me, especially when you find that same audio log from earlier, but now different. <laughs> I can't understand you. You need to listen. I saw something in there. There is something inside. You need to lock down the mirror. Exploring the mirror's synchronicity labs reveals a creepy copy of Jesse that you ultimately engage in a boss fight with. Now, I find the boss fights in Control to be one of its worst elements, which I'll explain more later, but this is probably my favorite in the whole game because you have your toolkit used against you. The mirror Jessie has your powers and your service weapons, so she levitates, hurls objects, and fires rockets from her service weapon at you. Once you beat her, that's it. There's a unique outfit you unlock, but nothing else. It works here though because the reward was the whole experience. The boss fight, the puzzle with the mirrors, the audio logs that build the tension, the lore of the item. It works and is satisfying without there needing to be some sort of classical type of reward. Another good example of the side content for me is also found within the research sector, where there are a series of offices set up to study the phenomenon of luck. 
This area in particular was one of the most memorable for me in the whole game because there's an unmarked side quest here that involves trying to increase your luck or probability of rolling a 7 on a roulette table. To do so involves specifically manipulating several objects around the lab, such as a horseshoe or a four-leaf clover, and there are hints spread about the environment to help guide you. Once successful, you unlock a special gold suit outfit for Jesse, and again, that's it. Now, I didn't know there would be a reward for actually rolling a 7, but I was curious about if it could be done. I spent time attempting it regardless of the possibility of a reward. So there are meaningful experiences to be had within the side content of the game, but just as many, if not more, often appear interesting on the surface initially, but end up being shallow in terms of the experience they offer. The value of each of these side experiences individually, as well as when taken as a whole, is obviously going to be subjective, but I would argue that there are nuggets of objectiveness tucked into these as well. Let's start with the optional boss fights. I would genuinely like to hear in the comments below if anyone found value in fighting Mr. Tomasi, the former head of communications who is now hiss-infected and serves as a hidden boss. He is likely the hardest boss in the game, which itself could provide value, but instead it's an absolute slog. His moveset is an exact copy of one of the standard enemies in the game, his only difference is that he has been made into a bullet sponge. This boss offers nothing new to the combat formula and didn't offer anything unique as a reward. Unfortunately, many of the hidden bosses are like this, and before people start angrily typing comments about how great the fridge duty mission is, let me explain. The hidden bosses in the game could be a reward for exploration, but it would require some sort of setup like a Soulsborne game, where players are required to learn timing and attack patterns in order to be successful against the bosses. I say this as someone who typically doesn't like the Souls series, but enjoys watching people who are good at them play them. From a world design standpoint, the extra bosses are fantastic, but unfortunately that is about all they offer, which is a shame because many of them have incredible setups. My mind immediately goes to the fridge duty mission I just mentioned. Watch its introduction. Keep your eyes open, fella. Keep them... Hey, what can I do? Oh, you're back. Oh, thank you, thank you. If, if I look away... I don't know what this thing will do. You have to get me out of here. The door can only be opened by the Panopticon supervisor. That's Langston, if he's still around. Langston. Yeah, I know him. I'll go ask him how to get you out. Please hurry. My eyes. They can't. They can't. Upon returning to relieve Philip, a problem occurs as you're trying to help him. Jesse? The fridge is doing something! Philip? Philip? If I look away, it hurts me. When you eventually attempt to interact with the fridge, you are taken to an arena in the astral plane and forced to fight this. This is likely to be the first of the hidden bosses that players find, and I think many players, myself included, found it easy to be swept up in the experience. The fight is pretty challenging at that point in the game, and so players will probably die a number of times, which allows for a replay of the section with Philip and the fridge. I know I attempted to figure out some potential way of saving Philip, but the game traps you in the room during his death. This only added to my enjoyment of the scenario and how cool it all felt. The boss, referred to as the former, has three moves. It can launch large tracking orbs from its eye and then has two variations of a stabbing attack. At first only doing it once and then as the fight progresses doing it three times in rapid succession. Players also need to be aware of their environment during the fight because one of the boss's moves leaves holes in the floor that players can fall through, which leads to their death. To defeat the creature, you hurl objects or shoot at its large eye. 
Now, I want to briefly put a pin in the discussion of this side mission in order to jump to one of the other side missions titled Old Growth. While exploring the research sector, you find a deep pit, and upon descending, players find themselves in an office and lab space overgrown with fungus. Probing a bit further introduces Dr. Underhill, a former employee and now contract researcher brought in to study the mold that has been slowly expanding throughout the oldest house. I call it mold or fungus because it's closer in appearance and behavior than anything else we know, except perhaps bacteria. She reminds me of my old biology teacher. She ultimately tasks Jesse with finding the source of the mold, and what follows is a truly atmospheric experience as players must traverse deeper into the mold threshold. The area is full of hard-hitting mold-infected enemies, and I couldn't help but wonder if this mold infection should be a much bigger concern since it appears to be essentially doing the same thing as the hiss, entering into our world, infecting people, and then continuing to spread. The mission culminates in yet another descend, this time towards the source. Is that the source? It's... kind of pretty. The boss fight is visually quite cool and initially also seems quite unique, however I realized something on my third attempt. The boss, referred to as Mold 1, has three moves. It can launch a series of small tracking spore orbs from its eye-type flower and then has two variations of a stabbing attack. At first, only doing it once, and then as the fight progresses, doing it three times in rapid succession. Players also need to be aware of their environment during the fight because one of the boss's moves leaves explosive spores around the environment, which, if triggered, leads to their death. To defeat the creature, you hurl objects or shoot at its large eye-type flower. Hopefully the point is clear, these two bosses, despite having terrific setups and appearing visually very different, are essentially the same fight due to having the same moves. You can even optionally fight the former a second and third time during another side mission and during part of the DLC. Nothing changes in these fights either, and so you're engaging in the same fight now at a much higher character level, already having knowledge of its moveset. This is my core problem with the hidden bosses. They can't be a reward if they are all more or less the same fight. It spoils a bit of each's setup if it leads to the same boss mechanically just reskinned. The anchor is yet another cool scenario that ultimately disappoints. It's the optional boss introduced during the side quest titled A Matter of Time. This mission is centered on Jesse attempting to rescue some bureau rangers from a sealed off section of the building. It's been sealed off due to something from another dimension getting its hands on an old clock and endlessly multiplying it until the whole area had been filled. As you engage in that mission, you learn that unrelated to the multiplying clocks, an infamous altered item, a large boat anchor, has been loose in the area. However, the rangers have temporarily trapped it in one of the bureau's safe rooms. While this background isn't necessary in order to understand the shortcomings of Control's bosses, I do want to give the background because it is interesting. It's cool, I probably sound like a broken record by now, but I can't emphasize enough how engaging Remedy has made this world. You naturally want to learn more. The fight against the anchor is a complete letdown. It rotates in the center of the floorless chamber, completely protected, and occasionally spews clocks out that damage enemies. The moments before or after this single attack are your windows to attack it yourself by hurling objects or shooting at its center. You have to be aware of your surroundings, otherwise you fall off the platforms and die. The fight only has a shred of difficulty because halfway through, regular enemies are spawned in order to divide your focus and to damage you. The first of the DLCs add two additional hidden bosses, however both are just spongy versions of regular enemies already found in the game. Process designer Gibbs is just a hiss distorted with an added cyclops laser attack, and the third act villain from the movie camera side mission is just a hiss elevated, each just have a larger health bar and little else. 
I think I've made my point about the extra bosses in the game, and with that I want to shift to the game's use of traversal challenges and puzzles. More specifically, I want to illustrate how underutilized these are despite how much potential they have within this world. Remedy seems hesitant to commit fully to having thoughtful puzzles and or platforming sections, and instead utilizes these elements in the most bare bones of ways. For puzzles, you will see the same two repeated over and over. The first is a pick up a battery and throw it into a terminal puzzle. There are almost never complexities added to this. The second type of puzzle involves copying various cube arrangements from one computer screen onto a second computer screen, typically unlocking some door or console function after having done so. These are used effectively during one of the main story missions, but then the concept is run into the ground from there on. The puzzles feel like someone came up with them at one of the early development meetings with the intention that they would get expanded upon, but then never did. Traversal challenges fare slightly better overall, with a few genuinely thoughtful situations, but still not up to what I think their potential could be. For example, one of the basic uses of traversal in the game is during the side mission to acquire the shield power. This power is granted by subduing an object of power, a large metal safe. The paranormal object is tucked away at the end of an obstacle course that was once used to train the Bureau Rangers for combat, and getting to it means that players must successfully get through the timed course themselves. While not significantly challenging, I did appreciate this side mission because of its temporary break from the combat. Another example of a traversal challenge is actually one of the many enemy obstacles you see throughout the game, the Astral Spikes. Your first encounter with one of these dangerous enemies is early in the main campaign where you need to safely lock it down before you can proceed. This was extremely stressful the first time, but in a good way, and having to figure out how to lock it down also incorporated light puzzle elements that felt more difficult because of the stress of the situation. These enemies are sprinkled throughout the oldest house, and prior to having the levitate ability are always stressful. Remedy does attempt to remedy these problems with the two expansions, as both feature side missions centered on various altered items, and they illustrate how with a crumb of extra attention, puzzles and platforming gauntlets fit right at home in this world and successfully serve as meaningful experiences. The train car altered item is a nice puzzle that requires players to chronologically piece together the events that occurred within the train car prior to its crash. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome aboard the Eagle Limited bound for Chicago. Please have your tickets ready and enjoy the ride. No unnecessary combat tacked on, just solving a light puzzle and some thoughtful insight from Jesse afterwards. You had a pretty dark ride, huh? But I hope you're done replaying it now. For an improvement to traversal challenges, we can look at the VHS tape Altered Item Quest. The light. Another TV. It puts players in a dark, maze-like cave system with many resilient enemies and an old VHS TV. The TV screen works to both provide a light source for players, but also to temporarily hypnotize enemies. The only means forward is to carry the TV-altered item through the caves, using it to freeze enemies in order to bypass them instead of the typical fighting. And while neither of these are perfect, they were at least attempts at creating unique, non-combat scenarios. This is actually frustrating to me because it draws into focus how little effort went into this same thing in the base game. There's a whole side questline titled Langston's Runaways that is centered on Jesse recapturing altered items that have escaped from the Panopticon. This should have been a golden opportunity to create some distinct gameplay missions because the altered items are essentially a license to get weird and creative. However, this entire mission is style over substance, and the style itself is only surface level at best. Sounds familiar, right? 
And while it might seem like overkill to go through each of the items in this side mission, I think it's important to, in order to fully understand how little work Remedy did when designing these missions, and to show that the foundation to build engaging puzzles or traversal challenges was already in place. But, since you're some sort of altered item whisperer, I've got a list of others for you to corral. The hiss are causing containment breaches left, right, and center. Here, start with these. I'll see if there are any others missing while you're gone. There are seven altered items you are sent after, however, that number doesn't account for the amount of recycled content within this mission. Two of the items, the Japanese paper lantern and the hand chair, function identically. Both items seemingly create a barrier by drawing items in around them that players must then destroy. You know what else did this exact action? The metal safe object of power that you get the shield ability from. The background documents on the lantern say that its characters spell out ramen and that it produces an attracting force both physically and psychologically. So maybe interacting with the item could have transported Jesse to an astral plane similar to what happens with the train car, although with this example, maybe it could have been like a restaurant street. Players could have played a game of hot and cold using the controller vibrations around the area to locate the lantern. For the hand chair, the way it hangs from the ceiling, twitching its fingers, initially made me think it would be acting similar to the Wall Masters from the Zelda series, which it doesn't. Its supplemental documents talk about how it was originally investigated because the locals thought there was a werewolf plaguing their community. So, uh, the Bureau had heard rumors of a uh, werewolf gathering upstate every full moon? Us being rookies, they sent us to confirm it was bullshit. Hold on, is he about to tell me werewolves are real? Turns out, there was an altered item that was creating violent gravitational anomalies during full moons. Oh man, we nearly bit it that night. Maybe there could be some sort of puzzle based around this background, or perhaps from watching the number of fingers it holds up or something. Continuing with the lost items, you have the rubber duck, which rapidly moves around the area while quacking, requiring you to chase and catch it. You also have the moving letters, which as the name suggests are letters that move around the area, requiring you to chase and catch them. These two are exactly the same, and the rubber duck is the more interesting of the two, so I'm not really sure why the moving letters even exist. Both of these don't even really present a problem, instead just requiring the players to run around until the items get tired and allow you to get them. Quacking. The last three items all were the best of the bunch, but also all still have problems. There's a flamingo altered item that has a smile inducing introduction when you witness its head peeking out from behind a door, and then it transforms into a wow moment right after as it creates a moving pink infused corridor. So what does this all lead to? Yet another fight against the former boss, which is exactly the same as it was with the fridge item. I truly don't get why this decision was made, because it makes both fights feel less special. The materials for this altered item also talk about how it potentially can influence the weather, so I don't know why Remedy didn't have that at play in this encounter. Next up is the mannequin dummy, which is initially interesting and creepy, but ends up being nothing more than walking down the hallway until you find the one that is the original and cleansing it. There's no payoff or any ramp up of tension or anything. No payoff for this, and maybe it's just because I've played Hogwarts Legacy recently, but that game does something similar with mannequins to a much greater effect. Why aren't they walking around? Why aren't they chasing you? Why aren't they set up in creepy poses? Nothing. There's nothing here. And our last altered item is the traffic light. This item moves through the traffic colors and plays out similar to red light, green light, the classic game. 
Players can move freely during either the green or yellow colors, but must remain still during the red light or else be sent back to the beginning. This is a fantastic idea executed poorly. You know how long it took me to complete this altered item? 1 minute and 20 seconds, and that is including the time spent waiting during the red lights. Why is this not a longer platforming and traversal segment? There's so much Remedy could have done with this one, including environmental challenges that require the player to plan moves further in advance, or timing levitations between platforms. This particular item was the biggest misstep in my opinion for this mission. The challenge was already created mechanically, just not expanded enough. Less escaped altered item to worry about. And now we have covered hidden bosses, traversal challenges, and puzzles, so this brings us to lore documents and audio logs to serve as potential rewards for the side content. My original stance was that while I generally enjoyed reading most, there were simply too many of them. How can these bits of lore be a meaningful reward when the game doesn't make them feel like a reward? They are everywhere, oftentimes with three or four in a single room. Over the course of my comprehensive playthrough, I've collected 375 collectibles in total, and I am 100% sure I missed some, perhaps even many. I also don't think the classic argument of, well, if you don't want to collect them, then don't, applies here, because as I've stated many times in this video, the whole point of this game is clearly the world building, it is the game as far as I'm concerned, so it doesn't make sense to play control and not try to learn as much as you can about the world. It'd be like playing Mario and not collecting stars, and I know that's not a perfect comparison, but I'm going to roll with it. Now, you might have noticed that I started this part by saying my original stance, and that was intentional because while initially this was something I felt quite convinced about when outlining the script for this video, in the process of making this side content section, I looked up the collectible numbers for a few other games that I considered to be fair comparisons. I fully expected the numbers to be significantly lower than Controls, but that's not what I found. In Prey, a game that I consider Control superior in every way, I had collected over 250 notes, emails, and audio logs. Plus, that game has a whole crew member tracking system that I consider a collectible, and of which I located 240 people. Batman Arkham Asylum has 240 collectibles itself, these being the Riddler challenges. Bioshock has 122 audio diaries alone. This one in particular surprised me because even hearing that number now, all I can think is, really? That many? I had guessed it was probably around 60 or 70. Both Rapture in Bioshock and Talos 1 in Prey are new locations that the developers had to start from scratch when building the world, and as such have many lore documents throughout. This is consistent and I think a fair comparison then with Control and the Oldest House. Now, the problem for me becomes why do the documents and audio logs in both of those other games feel more like rewards than they do in Control? I've seen complaints on Reddit about how Control makes players stand in one spot to listen to its audio logs as well as read its documents, and I agree that that is annoying. But I don't think it's the source of these feelings, because Prey often has players standing in place reading from computer screens. After giving it some thought, I think it's because the audio logs and documents in Control feel like reading a book within the game, versus in Prey and other immersive sims, a large amount of the documents typically lead to unlockables or rewards within the environment. Prey often hides passwords or door combinations within its documents, and so reading and engaging with the world building also leads to further exploration. The Batman Arkham games somewhat do the inverse. Engaging with the environment and solving puzzles often leads to the reward of lore through audio logs or profiles on the different characters. 
This isn't a perfect explanation for me, however, because I read the different books within the Dishonored series, and they often are just world building for world building's sake, with no rewards attached at all. I'm saying this in order to be completely fair to Control, because despite me being incredibly interested in the world, it feels like there are too many lore documents, and it eventually gave me the same feeling as reading books in Skyrim. This very well could be a me issue, however, and I accept that. Finally, I feel like I should mention the game's board countermeasure and bureau alert systems, however, I don't have much to say about either of them. I hated both and completely stopped engaging with them once I had earned the associated trophies. I found all of the procedurally generated mini-quests and objectives they offered to be shallow, tedious, and containing none of the parts that make Control successful. What makes the game successful is that the stories that are told throughout the oldest house outside of the main narrative are actually interesting, even if they don't end up being rewarding. They are bite-sized experiences that work to build the feeling of the Bureau, its weirdness, its history, and how it operates. Through them, the world expands in meaningful but also realistic ways. I say this because I think it's important for me to explain that despite the many problems I just went over in regards to Control's side content, it is successful in creating an interesting world. This is also a good segue into the discussion of the story because unfortunately the main narrative suffers very similar problems. When I first started Control, my big question was, why is it called Control? And I think this will naturally be something that many players ask when picking up the game. This question was rapidly followed by many, many more. Who or what is Jesse talking to in the opening segment? Where is everybody within the building? Who is this creepy janitor? Why does the previous bureau director commit suicide? What are the hiss? Who or what are the board? I would say one of the story's greatest strengths is its ability to create interesting plot hooks, and these are just the ones that crop up in the game's first hour. If you've made it this far into the video, it shouldn't come as a surprise that Control knows how to create intrigue. As I stated in my introduction thesis and have reiterated throughout this video, Control's main narrative suffers the same problems as the rest of the game. It's only there to build the world, as opposed to telling a compelling story. The plot, while having some genuinely interesting moments, is mostly content to simply be the vehicle that takes players to the various flashy and weird locations of the Bureau. The main story consistently experiences something similar to what I described happening with the Fridge Duty side mission. Many players will be easily swept up in the impressiveness of the locational set pieces they visit over the course of the story, and I agree that it's hard not to feel wowed the first time you enter Black Rock Quarry, or the Panopticon, or the Ashtray Maze. I would guess most people's first playthrough of the game, they don't realize how little meaningful story there is in the actual narrative how little you and by extension the main character Jesse do over the course of the campaign. This will be largely what we discuss in this section, but I want to quickly add something before we get going because I know what I'm going to say throughout this section might very well piss off fans of this game. The nature of both Control's story and its world unfortunately lend itself very well to the dismissal of any criticism against it. The phrase, you just didn't get it, is something I see thrown around a lot in regards to criticisms of this game's story, typically followed by multiple people giving their completely different interpretations of the same story events. And while opinions are certainly subjective, I think it's also important to not be blind to issues just because you enjoy something. The Dishonored series is one of my favorite game series of all time, and in my several critique videos over that series, I am quite harsh. Recognizing the problems, though, doesn't mean I like it any less. In fact, I oftentimes gain new appreciation for the games I critique. 
for me particularly, it's never about shitting on a product. That's one of the reasons I try not to do videos on games I feel more negatively on than positive. Criticism is about identifying problems with a title so that hopefully they can be addressed. Control starts with the main character, Jesse Faden, arriving at the Federal Bureau of Control headquarters, which appears to be a normal, albeit strangely, empty federal office building in New York City. She finds a single individual, a mysterious janitor, that offers her guidance on where to go. There you are. You are here about the job. Janitor's assistant. You need to go to the interview. Go that way to the elevator. Thanks. Elevator that way. Got it. This is Ati, and despite giving off horror vibes initially, it serves as a guide for Jesse throughout the story. You may have caught that I said it there just now instead of him, and that's because Ati is not human, but rather a paranormal entity, serving as the janitor within the oldest house. That title doesn't properly explain how important and powerful the entity is, but it is apparent right away to observant players as he replies out loud to Jesse's thoughts. I've done enough night shift loner jobs to know it makes us come off weird. Marty the janitor is a friendly face in my book. Better than somebody with no face at all. <laughs> Think about it. No face. Jesse enters the elevator and takes it into the oldest house proper, where we get two important plot setups. Did I lose you there for a moment? You know what's on my mind. My baby brother, Dylan. Seventeen years since the men of this bureau took him. The first is that Jesse is there searching for her brother, Dylan, who was taken by the bureau when they were younger. This goal, locating her brother, is the driving force for about 60% of the main narrative before transitioning to something else. I say driving force in quotations there, though, because while finding your brother is the player and Jesse's focus for the first half, it often won't feel like it. We'll return to this criticism in a bit. The second important plot setup is that we see Jesse talking with or to something. We don't know what exactly at this point, but it responds to her by sending a series of shimmers across the screen. Jesse hears a gunshot as she nears the office of the bureau director and within finds a body with what is presumably a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. A gun lies next to the body. I previously mentioned this gun, known as the service weapon, during the combat section of this video, stating that it was a paranormal item referred to as an object of power. Adding a bit more story context, it's particularly important because it can only be wielded by the director of the bureau. The service weapon is, of course, a prime example of an OOP, a very powerful one ingrained in the Bureau's DNA, a key component in our prime candidate program. Come out of that Russian roulette a winner and you, <laughs> you're it. Jesse picks up the gun lying next to him and is brought to the astral plane by a force called the Board. This group is a mysterious and powerful entity that is affiliated with the Bureau. Jesse is brought here in order to demonstrate that she is capable of binding the weapon and thus becoming the next director. She is successful and just like that is the director of the Federal Bureau of Control. This initially seemed too convenient and too quick for me, but is actually part of the larger plot, so we'll circle back to it later. Upon exiting the challenge, she receives a vision from the dead man, now officially revealed to be the former director, Zachariah Trench. In the vision, he warns that something threatening is coming to the Bureau. As Jesse leaves the office, she is attacked by some sort of resonance. This is the hiss, the interdimensional resonance that has begun assaulting the Bureau and taken control of a large number of the employees. 
Jessie is only able to withstand this force due to the mysterious entity that she is in communication with. She is forced to fight several Hiss-controlled guards, but is ultimately able to cleanse the executive suites of the Hiss corruption. Afterwards, Jessie finds several employees that were able to avoid being possessed by this force due to the devices they are wearing, called HRAs, and among those survivors is Emily Pope, the assistant to the head of the research division. And you entered the building when it was already in the lockdown before you became the new director? How? I'm not ready to tell her about you yet. A janitor let me in. <laughs> I love it. This is fucking unbelievable. It's... I can't even... The pair quickly develop a plan based on the limited information they have. Jessie will make her way to the communications department in order to locate and find another object of power called the hotline. This one opens up an official line of communication between the director and the board and takes the shape of a phone. Emily also speculates that Jessie might be able to have limited contact with the former director through it as well. Finally, Jessie also reveals part of her reasons for being there within the Bureau. Listen, the Bureau was involved in an incident in my hometown, Ordinary, 17 years ago. The Bureau came in and covered the whole thing up. I've been looking for this place for a long time. That's enough. Maybe that's too much already. I can't tell her about Dylan and the rest yet. I've seen mentions of an altered world event case dealing with Ordinary. You were at Ground Zero as a child? It was one of the big ones, and before my time. Everything I just described happens in the first mission of the game. All of these hooks and intrigue is the first 30 minutes. It's impressive and I think one of the best beginnings of a video game I've ever played. The second mission further continues with its foot on the gas. Jessie travels to the communications department where she finds an unexpected object of power in the form of a floppy disk. She is able to bind the object and gains her first paranormal power, the launch ability. Within this department she also fights Tomasi, the former head of the department who has become infected by the hiss. This is the first fight against him, but he escapes and becomes the hidden boss that we discussed earlier in this video. I want to note for people that haven't played the game that as far as the game presents, there isn't a way to uninfect those taken by the hiss. Jesse attempts to cleanse an individual but is unable to, and this is largely as much as it gets explored in the game. The mission leads players and Jesse to a light switch cord, and upon interacting with it brings Jesse to an old motel. Whoa, have we been here before? No. I've stayed at a lot of roadside motels across the country, on the road, on the run, under the radar. This feels like all of them, like something recognized from a dream. This is the Ocean View Motel and Casino. During an AWE investigation, our agents discovered a light switch cord in a Butte bungalow closet. They pulled the cord and were instantly transported to the Ocean View Motel and Casino. Dream like haze. Whoa. Inside, they found a door marked with an inverted black pyramid. And just like that, it led back to the oldest house, some 2,000 miles from Montana. Now we're finding the cord in increasing numbers throughout the Bureau. Somehow the two places, they became in tune to each other. The, the actual physical location of the ocean view is, is, is a mystery. Stepping beyond his walls has so far proven impossible. A place of power, like the oldest house. The Ocean View Motel, like many aspects of Control, as we'll come to see, doesn't get much more of an explanation, and I think it works with this specific example. The other doors in the motel assuredly lead to other weird locations or dimensions, and so seem ripe for a potential sequel.
The one problem I do have with this location though is that just like with many aspects of control, visiting the motel gets ran into the ground. You will visit this place many times and are forced to do small, menial puzzles each time in order to progress. This location is cool initially, but experiences diminishing returns every additional time you visit. I also understand that the location itself is a metaphor for traveling, as it is always used for transitioning to specific parts of the map. But that doesn't excuse it more or less being the same experience every time. During one of the visits, you can hear people outside of the motel, and I found this to be the most interesting trip because of it. It would have been nice if Remedy could have found some way to make each visit feel distinct. Jesse is brought back to the Bureau, now with access to the hotline, which she successfully binds, gaining access to communication with the board and the ability to listen to Trench. I really like the concept of the hotline, especially more of the Trench side of it, as it reminds me a lot of the Avatar state from the last Airbender series, gaining the wisdom of those previously in the director position. I hope in future games they expand on this, even if it's just the two who had access to the hotline prior to Jesse. The DLCs expand on the hotline communications a bit, but more to deliver story beats as opposed to providing lore and background. Jesse returns to Emily Pope and gets her next task, finding the other heads of the departments, and more specifically Helen Marshall, the head of operations, who is in the research sector. Unfortunately, due to the hiss, an internal lockdown is in place, meaning that the different sectors of the Bureau are locked down with no way in or out. Jesse needs to perform a directorial override in order to lift it, and that can only be done in the maintenance sector. This might seem like a no-win scenario because you'd be unable to get to the maintenance sector, but Ati, the janitor, opens up the elevator for you to get there. This obviously exposes a few issues. First among them is that if Ati has this power, why doesn't it just open up all of the sectors since apparently it operates at a greater power level? The obvious answer to this is because plot, but this is lazy writing. Second, and perhaps the bigger issue, if the director's office is in the executive sector and the director override for the lockdowns is in the maintenance sector, how is the director ever supposed to get there if there's a lockdown? This makes no sense, and even Emily has no ideas for how Jesse can get into maintenance. I feel like it would have made more sense for there to have been some sort of backdoor pathway that only the director can use that connects executive and maintenance. This would explain how it's done without Ati's assistance, however the game needs to develop Ati for later plot reasons, and so at the expense of the story, he is involved here. The third mission is where it becomes obvious that telling a meaningful story is Control's second priority behind showing off the Bureau and its weirdness. The first mission was an excellent introduction and established the situation as well as Jesse's motivations. While the second one does nothing to move her personal narrative forward, I think it gets a pass because it felt like they were further setting up and establishing this world in order to advance the plot. Which, remember, is to find Jesse's brother Dylan, who was taken by the Bureau when they were children. Well, unfortunately, none of the next three missions meaningfully work towards this plot point either, and are instead just busy work while Jesse and the player wait for the story to happen to them. Mission 3 sees Jesse enter the maintenance sector in order to lift the lockdown, but again, Ati has other plans for her. But first. We need to get you working. Very small couple of hours job. And so just like that, Jesse's new task is to fix the NSC power plant that provides the energy for the oldest house, otherwise it blows up. In isolation, this narrative diversion would be fine. This is a big enough scale of a problem to warn addressing immediately. There's actually some cool lore here as well about the power plant and how the director before Trench, whose name is Northmore, is actually the power source himself, now contained within the plant. This diversion becomes problematic, however, because both of the following missions are also diversions to the main narrative thread, sending Jesse on even more bureau business at the behest of others. This is an organization that Jesse shouldn't like or trust yet, but she is essentially just doing errands for them. You might be tempted to say, well, she's the director, she's obligated to do it. 
And while that may be true, I don't think this is actually a valid reason if the developers are trying to tell a meaningful story, which I'm hoping the discussion about these next three missions will be enough to convince you that they aren't. At the main power plant, Jesse meets a security chief named Arish, who has been stationed at the plant in order to protect it. Look, as you can probably tell, it's a bit of a shit show down here. We've been holding our ground, but whatever's gotten into our buddies has them wrecking the coolant pumps and the power converters. The NSC keeps overheating, and my crews keep getting shot before they have a chance to make any repairs. Arish gives you further directions on how to stabilize the power plant, requiring Jesse to plug numerous batteries into slots in the coolant pumps and the energy converters. Additionally, Ati, our janitor friend, also has her clear out a sentient clog in the pipeworks as part of this. With the plant stable, Jesse's able to lift the lockdown and reach the other bureau sectors. Jesse checks back in with Emily and we get a giant exposition dump. We learn some details about what happened to Jesse and her brother when they were kids. When we were kids, we found an old slide projector in Ordinary's landfill. The slides created doorways to other places. Bad things happened. Came through. Additionally, we learn more about the mysterious entity that Jesse is in communication with. Through one of the doorways, we met something. A being. A being? What kind of being? It's hard to describe, but it... She helped us. We managed to turn the projector off. The bad things that came through the doorways were gone. Can you tell me more about this being you found? Let's hope you two get along. She's been with me ever since ordinary. In my head. She led me to you. I call her Polaris. While I was listening to this for the first time, it's quite interesting to learn about Polaris and about Jesse's backstory. You then get sent off to the research sector to find the head of operations, Helen Marshall, because she'll likely have a lead on Dylan. However, it's deceptive how little has changed narratively after this conversation. You're in the same place, in fact, looking for leads on Dylan and knowing that somehow the Bureau is involved in their childhood events. Except now Emily and us, the player, know more about Jesse's background. This four-minute reveal sequence doesn't feel earned or as a result of the last mission, and it especially doesn't feel earned that Jesse informs Emily at all. Their conversation boils down to, yes, yeah, someone else might have the information you're looking for, and we're then sent off after them now. The fourth mission is centered on the research sector, which was my personal favorite area in the game due to all of the interesting lore and world building, but also from a design standpoint, it is unique, having a blend of more natural feeling spaces as well as classic labs. Jessie fights her way through the sector, including having her first interaction with an astral spike, those pulsating orbs I talked about in the previous parts of this video. Marshall and her forces are eventually located within the Luck and Probability Department. Here's the situation. Darling created the HRAs in a lab nearby. We need more if we're going to survive this attack. My rangers can't secure the lab alone, not against those things. We need more firepower. So now your mission becomes clearing a way to Dr. Darling's HRA lab, which you do, and within you even manage to turn the machine on, only to find out there's yet another issue. We need more Black Rock prisms to make this machine work. Darling has another lab, down in the Black Rock Processing Site and Maintenance. That must be where he keeps the prisms. But how long will that take? Nothing here is simple. I need to ask her now, before I go. I need something from you first. What do you know about Dylan Faden? I knew this was coming. Lives are at stake here, and we need this machine working to save those lives. Once that is done, Director Faden, then we can talk. 
This is the entire mission. And once again, you realize how little the narrative has actually progressed here. It's spinning its wheels, sending you out on yet another mission for someone else. Mission 5 takes Jesse back into the maintenance sector, but now into areas that have to do with the mining and processing of a substance called Blackrock. This material is used throughout the oldest house as a way to contain paranormal items and is described in-game as paranatural lead. It is also required by the machine Dr. Darling uses to build the protective HRA vests. Jesse investigates the processing area, only to find out that all of the black rock prisms have of course been shattered, thus now requiring her to enter into the quarry and literally blow off chunks of the rock in order to develop new prisms. This area, the quarry, more than any other in the game besides maybe the ashtray maze, was a complete wow factor for me. It's an incredible visual design and unlike anything else seen in game, it's explained in game as being a threshold, a space that connects our world to other dimensions. The mold area that we discussed during the optional boss section is another example of a threshold. After activating some explosives and picking up a chunk of the rock, several astral spikes spawn in the area, and short of their introduction area, this is the best use of them in the game. The nature of the quarry's winding pathways and because players don't yet have the levitate ability means that they will actually have to think on their toes about how to navigate and not get cornered by any of the astral spikes. Unfortunately, if you've been paying attention, you've likely seen the pattern. Jessie, who is looking for her brother, gets assigned a task by some individual that she's required to do. This task involves traveling to a new location within the bureau that adds something unique or weird to it. Mission 3 was the maintenance area and that clog entity, Mission 4 was the research sector as a whole, and Mission 5 is Black Rock Quarry. Each of these are visually interesting, provide great world building, and are distinct. However, each mission also requires that a side task is completed first in order to do the main task that Jesse was assigned. Mission 3 was lifting the lockdown, but required that Jesse stabilize the power plant first. Mission 4's goal was to locate Helen Marshall in order to get information on Dylan. However, once you found her, she required that Jesse help her get their unit to the HRA lab first. Once there, you still don't get any answers because Marshall orders you to retrieve a new Black Rock prism. Mission 5 sees you do this, but the stash of them is destroyed, meaning you yourself have to go to the quarry to make a new one. It's just a series of fetch quests within fetch quests, one after the other. You return to Marshall and finally receive updates on Dylan's potential location. Your brother is here. He was once known as Prime Candidate 6, codenamed P6. We brought him here after the ordinary event. He was groomed to be the future director. He had towns far beyond any other candidate in the program. Of course he did. This naturally leads into the next mission, which sees Jesse travel to the containment sector to find Dylan. However, I want to briefly discuss Jesse's motivations in the game, because while they do get better in the second half of the game, they are a mess up to this point. The narrative seems to have a hard time even deciding what Jesse's motivations are. It is said that she is here for her brother, as I continue repeating, yet up to this point, no meaningful progression of that plot has happened, and we are halfway through the game. The writing wants us to believe that Jesse cares about her brother, and the end of Mission 5 attempts to reinforce this with dialogue such as this. Do not let him out, Director Faden. How do I make her stop calling me that? I'm not here for them. However, she spent the majority of her time since entering the building just running errands for the individuals within. This sentiment about her brother also seems hollow when it's contrasted against other things she has said up to this point. Why am I here? I think you already know. Yes, I came for my brother, but there are other reasons, too. I said I was looking for answers, but I might never understand them. I'm not looking for proof this is already it, 
more than enough. No matter what they told me all those years, I know it's real now. I didn't imagine this. I want to be a part of this world. Everything here is crazy. Weird, but it feels... right. Like how the world should be. I am in an infinite building leading to different dimensions and I never want to leave. You know what? I'm happy. Happy to be here. I'm happy to be here, she says, while standing over a dead body. I think an argument could be made that Jessie isn't really here to find her brother, but rather to satiate her own curiosity and desires about this secret organization. I actually like this quite a bit, a Jessie who is really more selfish in her motivations, but acts like she is being noble and trying to save her brother. It would explain why she is more willing to do all of these side tasks and explore this world, despite also saying that she is there to save her brother. The problem is that this motivation doesn't make Jessie quite as likable, although I would argue that it makes her more interesting. I think a stronger narrative that would leave almost the entire structure intact would be to firstly have Jessie genuinely believe that her brother is dead. And second, that she has come to the Bureau to get revenge on Trench, Darling, and the FBC for what she believes was killing her brother, abandoning her, and invalidating the very real events of what occurred in her hometown of Ordinary. She could remember their faces and the Bureau seal from when she was younger and now is motivated to do something about it. She finds Trench dead and is confused but ultimately happy about it, and now intends to track down Darling. She takes the service weapon and is completing the fetch quests from all the different characters because she is using them to find Darling. However, through her interactions with people like Emily Pope and Arish, she comes to realize that not necessarily all of the people at the Bureau are monsters. She could also begin fully realizing what the FBC even does, and that it isn't quite as black and white as she once believed. She could find Marshall, learn that her brother is in fact still alive, and then be forced to determine what she wants, rescuing Dylan or continuing her quest for revenge against the organization. These don't even have to be mutually exclusive initially, but ultimately she pivots to helping her brother and taking charge of the Bureau in order to make it better than it was. These are just some basic changes that carry largely the same experience while also working with what occurs in the second half of the game. They also help support the central idea of control, which is about Jessie taking control and working within her own agency. Finally, they also make Dr. Casper Darling an even more interesting character. Darling is already the star of the show and really the main face of the Bureau, so consistently seeing him as this charismatic figure in the Bureau videos while also initially considering him the villain would be interesting, especially given where his own story ends. Mission 6 has Jesse enter the containment sector and more specifically the Panopticon, where paranormal objects and people are contained. We contain them, but they don't want to be controlled. We study them to discover what makes them tick. If this place were ever breached, it would be chaos of biblical proportions. She meets Langston, the supervisor of the Panopticon, and is told that before she can get to Dylan in the upper security levels, Jesse must deal with a loose object of power. This fetch quest involves locating and binding an old TV object of power that once done so grants the levitate ability. As part of doing this, Jesse also locates the former director's head of security, Salvador, who has been possessed by the Hiss. The levitate ability allows players to reach the upper floors and thus Dylan, or so you might think. Are you there, Jesse? Emily? He's gone. Dylan isn't here. He might be nearby. Or maybe the hiss got to him. I don't know. Jesse, listen. Dylan's here. 
With us. He just walked in. He says he is giving himself up. He's been affected by the hiss, but, but he is different than the others. We must isolate him. I'm on my way. I hate this. It turns out that he just manages to escape right before you find him and that he just travels to the location you've set up as a base. How does he get there? The only way out as far as we can see is through the supervisor office and Langston. It's also just again disrespectful to the player and their time to send them to this location and then say, haha, just kidding. It's actually where you started. The actual containment area for Dylan provides some good background information on what he experienced, and again, I think these would strengthen a narrative where this is Jessie's first time hearing her adult brother's voice. Like I said, I want to talk about Jessie, your sister. What about her? I just want to get your perspective. What do you think of her? What kind of person is she? That sort of thing. I adored my sister. When I was little, I mean, back in ordinary. And you don't anymore? When I first got here, sure. I'd always hoped she'd come too. Find me, to take me home. We went everywhere together. Why should this be any different? Casper said she could come too, to the Bureau. If she wanted to. But she never did. It would be further motivation for wanting revenge against Darling and the Bureau, which leads to a better narrative payoff in this game of Jessie deciding that her brother is more important. Once back in the executive sector, Jessie sees her brother for the first time since they were children. Can you hear me? Oh, come on, Dylan. I'm here. I found you. You lost them in your do you know who I am? Oh, you know me. Say it. You are Dylan Faden's sister. He's talking in the third person. Always a good sign. Do you know who you are? Not Dylan. Trench and Darling made sure of that. I'm P6. Oof, I got chills. That was emotional. This reunion is one of the few places in the game where the stilted dialogue and conversation pacing actually works, although I suspect that that wasn't intentional. I also think Dylan looks like a bald Jake Gyllenhaal, and after noticing that, I couldn't ever unsee it. The big point of this conversation is that Dylan has openly accepted the hiss, but is not affected in the same way as the others we've seen. He tells Jesse that the Bureau had brought the slide projector from the ordinary event back to the oldest house, and turning it on is ultimately what unleashed the hiss resonance throughout the building. Dylan explains that he himself was taken by the Bureau in order to be placed into the Prime Candidate program, with the intention of grooming him to one day become the director. He fell into our arms. No parents. They're gone casualties of an AWE. The boy has exceptional talent. The oldest house will be his home. We'll build him from the ground up. He'll be trained and taken care of. Darling can be in charge of this project. He urges Jesse to go to the Prime Candidate program in order to learn the truth about the Bureau herself. Jesse agrees, but with the real goal of locating the slide projector in an attempt to remove the hiss and save her brother. From here forward, the main driving force of the game shifts from finding Dylan to finding the slide projector object of power, which is good because it is the far more interesting part of this story. The seventh mission takes Jessie into the Prime Candidate program, where she learns that she was also considered one potential candidate to take over as director of the Bureau. This at least attempts to explain why she was able to bind the service weapon and so quickly become the director herself. Continuing deeper within the sector, Jessie finds a recreation of the ordinary Altered World event site that she was a part of as a child. We the player also gain a clearer understanding of what exactly happened there. Jesse and Dylan had found a slide projector in the town's local dump. Unbeknownst to them, it was an object of power that could connect to different worlds via the specific slides that came with it. The slide projector was stolen by other kids, a group of bullies, 
The bullies began interacting with a creature in one of the slides and as such became increasingly violent. A curfew was enacted within the town afterwards and the following morning all of the adult population vanished. The cause of this is still unknown. Jesse and Dylan were able to steal the projector back but were not able to power it off. They eventually received help from an entity in one of the other slides. This is Polaris. The bullies disappeared when the projector was turned off, and Jesse burned all of the slides except one labeled slide 36, which was the one containing Polaris. The Bureau, specifically Darling and Trench, arrive in Ordinary shortly after this, with Jesse escaping them, Dylan being captured, and the projector being confiscated. Jesse finds Darling's lab site and discovers that the slide projector is no longer in the current department, having been moved to a new branch called Dimensional Research. This is yet another goose chase, sending players in one direction only to reveal that their princess is in another castle. The background information presented is very interesting, however, and does make it feel like at least some progress is being made. Mission 8 involves getting into dimensional research, however to do so requires traversing an area called the Ashtray Maze, which unfortunately is not possible on your own. Jesse is psychically contacted by Ati the janitor, because why not, and told that it has something that will allow her to pass through the maze. Locating Ati takes Jesse through the Ocean View Motel again, Black Rock Quarry, and finally towards the foundations of the oldest house. Ati gives Jesse its cassette player, which will get her through the ashtray maze, and that is where the ninth mission begins. So, I'm just going to rip the band-aid off right away. I don't love the ashtray maze. I don't consider it even in my top five favorite parts of the game. And before you hit that thumbs down, I recognize that this could be and likely is a me issue. Because see, my introduction to this area didn't come in mission 9 where we're currently at, it came during the fourth mission. As I'm sure many of you did, I stumbled upon the ashtray maze while exploring the research sector in mission 4. As you approach, Trench gives a speech about the area. The ashtray maze they conjure is an impossibly changing labyrinth that no one but the binder, and those the binder invites, can ever pass through. The things we hid in dimensional research, the things Darling studies, the danger and the risk involved, call for every measure of security and protection I could bring to the table. The maze hands down, is our strongest lock. And I assumed it was too dangerous for me, and I turned away. I'm lying. I spent 30 minutes trying to brute force my way into and through the maze. Trench's warning, as well as the in-game name Maze, implied to me that it was a puzzle and that you just had to be clever enough to solve it. And by God, I consider myself an intellectual, and so I was going to solve it. This is also in the phase of the game where you, the player, are being introduced to more and more side content and secrets. So I incorrectly assume this to be part of that side content, like the Mirror World or the Mold region. I went through the maze cycle multiple times before realizing there was a pattern to the path it sent you on and how long it took to spit you back out. This obviously told me that I was doing something wrong, but also that there was a pattern to begin with. I saw the wall art and assumed maybe it held some sort of clue. I thought maybe I had to be quick enough to hit the openings before they closed, or step on certain spaces, or not step on certain spaces, or go backwards through it, or do something with this unlit light. I'm a bit ashamed to admit that I spend a lot of time <laughs> fixated on this. I looked for tiny inconsistencies and then filled in the blanks myself. This obviously has something to do with it, I'd tell myself, and spend five minutes thinking I was close to cracking it. I eventually gave up. If you've played the game, you know how futile all of this was. As I mentioned earlier, it's impossible to get through the maze because it is part of the main narrative. You can't do it until you get the cassette player from Ati. I was obviously disappointed, but also excited to finally do it here because so many reviews and commentators mentioned this being their favorite part of the game. 
I was disappointed to learn that not only does the ashtray maze not require any sort of puzzle solving, but it's merely a set piece. A very cool looking one, I'll admit, with a very cool song playing over the experience, but a set piece nonetheless. No options, no using the music as some sort of guide through the puzzle, just killing enemies like everywhere else in the bureau, but now in a shifting series of rooms. And I admit that it's cool, but when I finished it, I thought, that was it? And I recognize that my initial experience trying to solve it has impacted how I view it, but I do think objectively it is at least misnamed as using maze creates the expectations of some sort of puzzle. This also should in no way be taken as me telling others that they shouldn't enjoy this segment. I know that for many people, it was their favorite part of the game, and that is valid for their experience. Completing the ashtray maze finally leads Jesse into dimensional research, where Dr. Darling conducted experiments with the slide projector and slide 36, the one that contains Polaris. However, the projector is not here either, and as Jessie searches the labs to figure out where it was taken, she makes a different discovery. Expedition 3. We located the source of the resonance in Slidescape 36. It is an entity, a living organism of a considerable mass. I I've named it Hedron based on its physical shape. Hedron? We, 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 we built a Was that for it. you? Did he bring you here? Is that why you brought me here? You're here. We also witness the final recording from Dr. Darling, who reveals that he's been fully exposing himself to this Hedron resonance, and it has changed him. He discovered that there was another resonance, the Hiss, that Director Trench was exposed to and that he fast-tracked the development of the HRAs in order to attempt to head off whatever this other frequency and Trench had planned. Finally, Darling states that he won't be here when the Hiss emerge and doesn't reveal where he's going. Jesse, without giving it much thought, rips off the large-scale HRA that was built to protect the chamber containing Hedron, and in doing so unleashes the Hiss into the chamber, likely as Dylan planned. She fights her way through waves of the Hiss, but is unable to stop them from destroying the container and Hedron itself. Without it, her connection to Polaris is severed and the Hiss take control of her. There's a fake-out credit roll, but it quickly gives way to the 10th mission, which starts in an ordinary office space with Jesse being assigned mindless office tasks. And if it seems like I just glossed over the whole Hedron Polaris reveal slash death, I'll be returning to it, but want to discuss the base game's final mission first. Jesse, in this dreamlike world, completes various office tasks as part of a routine while also slowly coming to that the Hiss are attempting to take control of her. In this process, we also learn the details of how Director Trench helped the Hiss. I have a plan, an answer. I'll take the slide projector to the nostalgia department. I'll turn it on. I'll bring the Hiss in. I'll fix this. I can hear them plotting against me. We've been invaded, corrupted. I've lost Darling. He was the first to go. He's been exposed to Hedron's resonance. It controls him now. And finally, Dr. Darling reaches out via the hotline in order to provide a bit of vague insight, if you want to call it that, about Hedron. Jesse travels to his office and utilizes a light cord to once again get to the Ocean View Motel. It's there that she is reunited with a version of Polaris that resides inside of her. Hedron is dead, but you're alive here in me. Maybe Hedron put you in our heads when we met her. Maybe you were always there. And she was just trying to teach me how to trigger you. Maybe I'll never understand. Maybe I don't need to. 
We'll get back to that last line in particular because I think it's bullshit, but for now, Jesse heads to the nostalgia department in order to once and for all shut off the projector. What happens next is an absolute slog of enemies as you fight your way forward, eventually reaching Dylan who has escaped from his containment. Jesse approaches the slide projector and proceeds to turn it off. Through a cutscene, we see that Dylan ends up in a coma. The portal is closed, but the hiss remain in the building, thus meaning the external lockdown remains. With Darling gone, Jesse makes Emily Pope the new head of research, and that's it, at least excluding the DLCs. My problem with this ending comes down to two things. One, that it's needlessly confusing, and directly tied to this, number two, that the game doesn't think it needs to provide explanations for all almost anything. It's content to have Jesse say, I don't think we're ever going to understand all of this, and I'm okay with that. And then hand wave everything else away. I am not the person that needs everything explained. This is obviously going to be a franchise, so some things, like what exactly Ati the janitor's role is, or what the board are, are mysteries that I don't need to be explained, potentially ever, even in sequels. But you can't do that with everything because otherwise you aren't really telling a story. It is cheap to at the last second introduce Hedron just to kill it off and use it as a means of allowing Jesse to be vulnerable to the hiss. What's worse is not clearly explaining how the Hedron Polaris dynamic actually works with Jesse. Darling in the hotline message says Hedron was a catalyst, almost like a broadcast tower. So Jessie loses her connection to Polaris, who I originally thought was still within slide 36. The whole segment in the Ocean View Motel with the Polaris copy, I took to be symbolic. Jessie finding her own power, you know, taking control of her destiny. Polaris sacrificed their connection through Hedron in order to stop the hiss. But no, this also isn't correct because Polaris is shown to still be in contact with Jesse later in the first DLC. You with me? So Jesse has now become some sort of broadcast tower herself, something Emily Pope theorizes. Then on the other hand, we have Dr. Darling talking about communicating and interacting with Hedron, making it sound like it is the entity that they brought back from slide 36. It's confusing, and the game makes no attempt to actually explain any of this. This also kind of negates Jesse's whole story arc, which seemed originally to be about finding the power within, hence the severance with Polaris. At the end of the game, they are still in contact, Jesse is still relying on her, and is still getting her extraordinary abilities from this entity. And there's another issue as well. Why was Dylan put into a coma but everyone else remains hiss infected? I can actually answer this one. It's because the hiss can't be defeated yet due to the developers wanting there to be enemies around as you complete any side content and the DLCs. There can't be a meaningful resolution to the hiss because of this. We have no idea if the hiss infection is reversible or if just everyone who is infected is basically dead. And I'm sure that this will get addressed in the sequel, but it feels cheap because it is a core part of this game's narrative. And unfortunately, the DLCs do little to remedy these complaints. Control received two small expansions after its release. The Foundation, which serves mostly as an epilogue to the main story, and AWE, which serves to establish a shared universe between Control and one of the developer's previous games, Alan Wake. If I had to summarize my thoughts on the narrative value of these two expansions, it would be that I like the intention of the Foundation expansion, but the content of AWE's. The first is centered on Jesse helping the board with a crisis in a new region of the oldest house, the Foundation. We briefly saw the entrance to this area during Mission 8 when trying to locate Ati for his cassette player. An object known as the Nail, which connects the astral plane to the oldest house, has been damaged and infected by the Hiss. 
Jesse goes about repairing the nail in a series of repetitive tasks, and during the process unlocks two abilities that can be used only within the foundation. These are Create and Fracture, which work by temporarily spawning or destroying rock pillars and spikes. These powers are restricted to specific spots on the map, and so don't offer the type of freedom that the others have, and as such are largely a waste. The narrative of this expansion is also tied to locating Helen Marshall, the head of operations, who disappeared after revealing Dylan's location in the base game. Through the first two missions of the DLC, she communicates with Jesse in a fashion similar to Trench from the base game, and this narrative culminates in finding Marshall but being too late to save her, as her HRA was damaged, rendering her vulnerable to the hiss. She serves as the final boss before Jesse can fully cleanse the nail of the Hiss influence. We also learn that Marshall was the one who originally damaged the nail, attempting to destroy it with explosives. This was in an attempt to sever the astral plane and board from the oldest house. She was unsuccessful, and it's stated that the board were the cause of her HRA malfunction. I tried to get out after the detonation but the astral spike came out of nowhere. I escaped, but my HRA was damaged. I'd bet a year's salary the board sent it. We never did see eye to eye. They have too much control over Trench, the Bureau, the House. They make themselves part of every important process. I find it odd the way this particular plot point is presented. Did you ever find Marshall? I did. She's gone. She died thinking she'd save the Bureau. Not a bad way to go. Yeah, but she literally could have killed everyone because she didn't truly understand what she was doing with her bombing. I don't understand why her actions are seen as heroic because it's another example of the employees of this organization acting without the proper information, and seemingly this is what Jesse intends to fix rather than provide a coherent explanation for where Marshall goes during the main game, it feels like this expansion is really just here in order to create tension between Jesse and the board. To create doubt about their motives, even the former, that extra boss from the Fridge and Flamingo missions, shows up and will actually have a conversation with you that also reinforces this mistrust of the board. Are you part of the board? Are used to be? Okay, so you split because the board blamed you for... <sighs> Gotta be easier to play charades. This is all fine, except that mistrusting the board wasn't something I personally felt throughout the base game, and so the heavy-handedness of it here makes it feel like Remedy are quickly baiting stuff for the sequel. And again, establishing these future plot points is fine, but they shouldn't come at the expense of a complete story here, either. As it is, it just sort of ends with a generic I'll be ready from Jesse that seems like it would be more at home in a Marvel movie than this game. Marvel movies are a good segue into the second expansion titled AWE, which sees Jesse travel to a previously closed sector of the Federal Bureau called the Investigation Sector, which was responsible for, as the name suggests, investigations into altered world events as well as other paranatural related happenings. It's a good premise greatly executed, as it leans into the parts of control that make it successful, the paranormal environments, the altered items, and the world building. I said that Marvel movies were a good segue, because while establishing a new sector of the Bureau and the lore that goes with it was absolutely a focus, Remedy takes this expansion one step further in that they establish a connection to one of their previous games, Alan Wake creating, in effect, a shared universe between the two series. For the process of making this critique, I decided to go back and replay Alan Wake, not only because of this expansion, but in case there were tie-ins from the base game that I missed. That turned out to be completely unnecessary, as the expansion clues you in on basically anything that is relevant. Alan Wake was centered on the titular named writer, who travels with his wife to the small town of Bright Falls in Washington State. 
During this trip, his wife is captured by a dark presence that is trapped beneath a lake nearby called Cauldron Lake. The rest of the game sees Alan Wake trying to rescue his wife from this dark presence while also living through the events of his current thriller manuscript, Made Real. The game is obviously more nuanced than this, but this description works for our purposes. Control takes the events of that game and turns them into an altered world event, or AWE, within its world. Alan Wake has been missing since the events of that game, which was around 10 years ago. Jesse is brought to the investigation sector by a vague hotline communication from Alan Wake, urging her forward. We are informed of what happened in the sector. Emile Hartman, a psychologist and antagonist from Alan Wake, was being contained at the FBC after the events of the Bright Falls AWE. Dr. Emile Hartman was desperate. The Federal Bureau of Control had stolen his life's work. This was his last chance, his final experiment. What he'd been too scared to do before. Hartman dove into the lake, was taken devoured by hungry darkness, became the thing that had been Hartman. Only an echo of him remained, fragmented impulses on autoplay, violent, bloodthirsty darkness in the driver's seat. Emerging from the lake, the thing was captured by the FBC, brought in, contained, studied. The thing broke loose, killed everyone it could. The FBC fell back and sealed the sector. The thing was alone in the dark, lurking, roaming, waiting. Then something else came. Not darkness, but similar enough. A sound. A resonance. This thing that used to be Emile Hartman was infected by both the darkness and the hiss resonance, turning him into some kind of new entity. This is the focus of the expansion, stopping Hartman and clearing the investigation sector. This is pretty standard, as Jesse will encounter and fight the Hartman entity four times around the sector, using light to damage the darkness that is infecting him before ultimately beating him for good. I found the boss fight against Hartman to be awful, as you're required to constantly juggle damaging him and plugging light batteries in. It became quite tedious for me. The expansion ends with the reveal that there's an AWE alert for Bright Falls once again, this time however for a date in the future. Relevant to this, we learn throughout the expansion that Alan isn't just missing, but more specifically that he's trapped in the darkness threshold at Cauldron Lake, and the expansions present some interesting potential resolutions to this. In Alan Wake, he has the ability to write fiction into reality, and part of this expansion dances with this idea. Is Alan Wake creating the events of the FBC in order to eventually be found, or is he just bending the events of the real world? Said another way, did Alan Wake create the events of Control, the FBC, and Jesse in order to create his own escape? If I had to guess what route I think Remedy is going to take, it'd unfortunately be yes, he did create everything himself, because the last communication with him seems to hard imply as much. Wake used the materials he had, the connections he had, the people, the places. Wake put them in to make it true. His wife, the psychiatrist, his city. These connections, like magnets, move things. Alice was a conduit. She'd been in the dark place. The thing that had been Hartman sensed her near, sensed Wake through her. Went berserk. Broke loose. Wake made sure Alice was already gone by then. Safe. The more springs, the more the story became real. The more people believed. Cause and effect. It was extremely delicate and hard work. It had to go through the path of least resistance where success was most likely. Where there was a connection already. Wake felt the pressure grow in his head, going mad. Wake had to escape. Right. His. Escape. He was already out. He wanted to make it true. Wake needed a hero. A hero needed a crisis. For the part in the story about the government agency, Wake needed something special. Something to convey an alien force mimicking human intelligence. Something that can't be translated translated.
Although this could just be that he is injecting the things he knows of in order to pull it towards him, but then this begs the question of how does he know about the FBC, Jesse, Polaris, etc. in the first place? I actually really hope that I'm wrong here and that he's instead just bending the events or nudging individuals in certain directions, as the alternative nullifies the events of the base game and its wonderful world building in my mind. Using the new and frankly more interesting IP as merely a narrative tool for the older one is cheap. Regardless, I imagine we'll get answers in the eventual sequel to Alan Wake. Now, notice I hardly mentioned Jesse at all during the discussion of this expansion, and that was intentional. This would be my biggest complaint with the story of this expansion, that it seems more interested in setting up this Remedy-connected universe and Alan Wake's return than being a meaningful continuation of Jesse's story. Control started out as one of my favorite games I played this year. It's hard not to get sucked into the lore of the world and the oldest house. It starts incredibly strong and continues to throw interesting idea after interesting idea at you. Where it largely stumbles is in its ability to create meaningful rewards or conclusions, if you prefer that word, to these mini-scenarios. It attempts to hide these faults by leaning into the unknown and its supernatural elements trying to use them as a get-out-of-free-jail card for not having a clean resolution that makes sense. While mysteries and unexplainables can be good, sometimes even great, they aren't a substitute for demonstrating that you actually understand how your own creations operate. The rules, you could say, because even if the setting is science fiction or fantasy or supernatural, what separates good science fiction or fantasy or supernatural is that they create their own rules and then stick to them. Control has many faults, but I also can understate that what it gets right, it absolutely excels at. I know that I likely came across harsh, especially in regards to the story, but I want to plainly state that I like this game. Similar to Jesse, I want to have more stories in this world, and not just at the oldest house either, but after playing the DLCs and then replaying Alan Wake, I'm all in. I'm cautiously excited for Alan Wake 2, and while I found the original lacking in many ways, with some issues similar to Control and others different, I'll play it because I'm interested in this Remedy-connected universe they appear to be building. I think the natural progression for this universe is to continue leaning into the best parts of it, the world and lore, while also trying to provide a more complete narrative and a more complete total experience. I think a natural way to accomplish this is to shift the focus to being on Jesse traveling to AWEs that are occurring throughout the country, while also tying them together into bigger plot devices, probably something to do with the board and the former. This allows for the continuation of building the world while also getting Jesse out to interact with more characters and situations. While the oldest house is fantastic and should absolutely still be present, I hope it becomes more of a home base as opposed to a reset and re-exploration. I also hope, although I think it's unlikely, that the sequel moves on from the Hiss Resonance. While they serve their function well in this game, having a repeat of the same general enemy types seems a bit boring considering that Remedy has a license to get crazy and weird with its universe. I say this is unlikely because both Dylan's Coma and Dr. Darling's whereabouts are left as mysteries that seem ripe to explore, but both seem inherently tied to the Hiss. Everything I've just said here could also be non-issues, given that Alan Wake 2 is on the horizon and could completely change up what Control's sequel is about. This is both exciting as well as potentially worrisome. Hopefully, if Remedy has taken any lessons from the modern Marvel movies, it's that each product needs to stand on its own two feet, not merely as a stepping stone for other future projects. On the other hand, Remedy has the chance with this connected universe to create something truly unique, but also meaningful in a way that no other game series has ever done before. I personally hope that they are successful.
As always, thanks for watching. I know these types of videos aren't for everyone, both because of their length as well as the fair criticism that they often become nitpick the video in some people's eyes. If you got some sort of value here, perhaps consider subscribing. And if you're new to the channel, I have three other long form video critiques similar to this one. One focused on Dishonored, another on its Doubt expansions, and finally a third dedicated to Red Dead Redemption 2. The next video is likely going to be on the indie game Lacuna. I know indies, particularly the non triple I variant, aren't everyone's cup of tea. However, it's one that I recently played, have several thoughts about, and think could be of interest to a large portion of you watching. This will likely be a much smaller video, which is also part of the reason for choosing it. After doing three multi hour videos back to back, I want to do a smaller one. Ultimately, I would like to transition to a format where the longer projects are broken up by smaller ones, as this would help create a somewhat more consistent release schedule so I'm not always dropping off the map for three months. I've also posted a poll on the community tab with several options I'm considering for the video after the Lacuna one. While I make no promises about the selection, I would love to see where the community's interests lie. Additionally, feel free to write a specific game recommendation in the comments as well. And with that, take care.